So welcome to today's session. I'm again very excited to have everyone here. I've been loving running these free live webinars uh, in the last few months. I feel like it's my way of helping people out during this crazy time. So, so thank you for coming along. My name's Katie and if I haven't met you before, I run my own business, Midnight Music, and I help our music teachers with all things technology related. So I do that through workshops and online training and I have a podcast and a blog and I when life is normal-ish, I go and run live workshops quite a bit and present at conferences and so on. I'm actually really missing that at the moment, especially the conferences. This is where I connect with people and learn new things myself. So I'm a bit sad that I'm not sure when they're going to start up again or if they're going to start up quite as we knew it. Now, a few housekeeping issues as usual before we get started. Um, if you have tech issues during the session, i.e., I stop speaking or moving or you can't hear me or something happens, it's usually internet related at your end. So just refresh the page, kick your kids off Netflix and PlayStation, whatever you need to do to get back on. Uh, you can shut down the browser and come back in again, uh, restart your laptop, whatever you need to do, but just uh, try that first before asking Martin for help. Um, if you're the only one in the chat window who's saying you're having problems, it is most likely that it's at your end and not necessarily mine, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So a copy of the slides will be provided. So what I'm showing you today, you'll be able to download a copy afterwards and that will be within around 24 hours of this session taking place. So I've mentioned I have Martin Emo helping out today who's moderating the chat window. I won't be able to look at the chat window during the session, but I will jump back in at the end and we will have a longer question and answer time then. In the meantime, Martin does an awesome job of helping out everyone in the chat window. So thank you ahead of time, Martin. <laughs> So today's session is all about free tech resources and those of you who have been uh, with me, following me, subscribed to my blog or my newsletter or anything else for the last few years uh, might be familiar with the fact that every year I put out an, a new edition of this which is the Ultimate Free Music Tech Resources Guide. So we have literally scrambled <laughs> to get this one together by today so that you can download it uh, today. And um, when I say scrambled, I was I was finishing off things and a couple of people on my team were finishing off things. Well, it was midnight for me last night and it would have been slightly different time zone for other people that I work with, but it was done yesterday. So I we're, we're really hoping everything's all right in there, everything's good. I've checked things through, um, but yes, I'm really excited about this one. So as I said, it's an annual guide. I update it. I add new things as I find them. And when I say new things, they're not necessarily new in existence. They are new to me or new to the guide. So you will find that there are around, Michelle, who I work with, actually counted how many. There are around 50 or more new things that we're putting into this year's guide. We have had to take out a few things as well, which I'll talk about in a moment, but um, there are around 50 new things in the guide this year, so I'm really excited. Now, if you want to download a copy of that, this is the link here. So this is different to the link I gave earlier. This is the link to the entire guide. So midnightmusic.com.au forward slash free guide 2020. And I'll put that link up again at the end. I will also add that link to the Wakelet collection, which I forgot to do before this session started, but I'll do that as well later. So this is the link to the entire guide, but if you want to get just the links to the things I'm talking about today, that was the link I showed earlier, and Martin can pop that again in the chat window if you need that one. Okay, I'm going to move on from here. Martin's got this link as well if anyone needs it um, after I've removed it from the screen. So about this session, I have picked a few highlights from the guide. There are some old favourites that I'm going to talk about today, which I think I've talked about every single year. Um, I first put this guide out in 2014. I had to look that up last night. Um, so this is the six-ish edition of the guide. And so there are old favourites in there which have been in there from the beginning and are still favourites of mine which appear in the guide. 
Now, I am going to talk today also about a few new discoveries. And again, these may be like brand new in existence things, or some of them are just new to me. And I'm just going to talk about them or they might be just things that I've I've actually picked a couple of things which have been in the guide for years, which I feel like people should know more about. So I've picked a couple of those <laughs> and I'm going to show those today and why I like them. So there are many, many, many more things in the guide itself. And so if you want to follow up with that, um, that would be great. These are the areas that I'm going to cover today. So we're going to look at things which are in the compose and create type category, we're going to look at things which are virtual instruments, a collection, a few things which are to do with instruments of the orchestra, things to do with creating your own resources, making your own videos, and I've got a few things I had no category for, so I've called them miscellaneous extras. Right, before we get started talking about free resources, I just want to say a few things. So, there are limitations to using free resources and I think it's really good to have a mindset that they are mostly simple tools, easy to use tools, they are things that you might use as a springboard for activities, they may not be the entire thing that you need, it's not going to meet all of your needs, you can use them in conjunction with other things which are more fully featured. And these tools are not always fully featured themselves. Some of them are, but most of them are not. It's really good to think of free resources as a way to supplement the more fully featured paid options. So if you need a digital audio workstation, something that records audio, records MIDI and so on, you might be better off with a paid option and then you can supplement activities that you do with some free things along the way. The other thing I'll say is with free uh, resources, you do need to just check the age requirements, the privacy, the restrictions on uh, kids of certain ages using them. Make sure that it's a safe environment for your students to work in. That is one of the things you get with a paid software program is that sort of protection and that private area for you to work. And that is not always something you get with a free tool. Some of them do have this, but it's just really um, good to be aware that you need to check that. The other thing, uh, which is a limitation of free websites, is that they can just disappear literally overnight or they can just stop working. And part of that is to do with the fact that a number of these sites are maintained as a side hustle, a hobby, uh, some sort of area of interest and it's done by someone who's developed the site and it's in their spare time and they just may not have the time to, to do the upkeep on the website or the money to support it anymore and they just disappear and you kind of have to just roll with that. And that leads me to talking about flash-based sites do you like my picture? <laughs> I was thinking, what can I use for a picture? And I Googled Flash and went, okay, well, that will do. Um, Flash, if you didn't already know, Flash is a technology which is used by a number of websites and has been used by a number of websites since it came into existence in the mid-90s or so. I think it was 96. And Flash is being discontinued at the end of 2020. So this is something that's made by Adobe. It's a, a technology which is used by a lot of interactive music sites and it will not exist after 2020. Now, some people have started to realise this and a lot of their favourite websites are going to die off and disappear. Um, and that is just the way it is. You've got to let it go. Don't be looking for workarounds of other ways to run it or device old devices that you think you might have that it, it's just not going to happen. You've got to let them go and find other options. Take a deep breath and I think it'll be okay because there are some other things that you can substitute your favourites with. They're not going to be identical, but they will still work um, to, su to support what you're doing. Okay, so I hope that wasn't um, heartbreaking news to anyone. I think most people have caught up with that fact right now, but um, yeah, there are some things that will be disappearing. So let's get on to looking at some of my hand-picked options for today, and I'm going to start off with virtual instruments. Now, I've picked virtual instruments to talk about today, and this has probably got the most things in this category uh, for today's session. 
Virtual instruments, lots of people have been asking about what to use, particularly in this remote online learning type scenario where you can't use real instruments. Maybe you're not with the kids, they are at home or you're in a situation where you cannot use anymore the the instruments that you were going to play on physically. And so virtual instruments may be an option for you. So I've handpicked just a few. There are more in the guide, as I mentioned. But I'm going to show you these ones. I'll talk a little bit about these ones today. So I'll go into each of them in a bit more detail. But I've got a couple of piano options, three or four piano options, and a xylophone option as well. So the first one is Play Sprout. And this is, well, Play Sprout is the website. Xylo is the app that they have. And I've just shown this one because when you open it up on the screen, it just looks really beautiful. It's just simple and big and bold and it actually makes a xylophone sound. So sometimes you'll find an online xylophone but it actually sounds like a glockenspiel. It's not the end of the world but I love this one because it actually sounds like a xylophone. So this is really nice. It is big and bold on the screen and it works on all devices and if you have a touch screen uh, device you can actually play the notes obviously with your finger. If you don't you can either click on these with your mouse or you can use the letters on your computer keyboard or you can use the numbers on your computer keyboard. Now, it doesn't do anything fancy. So it doesn't do things like record and whatever. It's just there to play as an instrument. So I just like this one because it's very big and bold on the screen and it's a great interface. Now, you can open it up in the browser and use it there. They also have like a kind of like a Chrome extension app that you can install as well so that it lives a little bit more permanently on your device. So you can explore that too. But um, I hope that you find that one really useful for some of you that work with younger students. So let's talk about a couple of virtual pianos. Now, th this one I really quite like. This is a, it's like you've got a synthesizer on your desk. And again, you can open this up and you can play with your computer keys play the notes that are on the keyboard. This one's kind of nice. It's got a few extra things as in you can actually record what you're doing. You do need to sign in to do that, but you have the option of recording and playing back what you've done. There are some sounds in here. There's four different synth sounds to choose from. I've got a note at the bottom there, sustain is on by default. I'm not quite sure why they do that, but sustain is on by default. So when you start playing and you've got that sustain thing going on, um, do turn it off if you want to or tell your students that they'll need to turn it off if they, they don't want that on there. There are also a few preset songs in here. So you can actually bring the songs up in a menu, select one and hit play. Um, awesome classics like Feralise and things like that. So I, I try to avoid those. But anyway, they're there if students actually want to play those too. So again, just a nice, simple um, on, online piano. I've got an alternative one on the next page to show you, which is just called Virtual Piano as well. They're all called Virtual Piano, so it gets very confusing. This one is on the Musica website and it has a nice piano sound. Now, again, this one's even more simple than the previous one. So if you want something that's very clean with fewer options, and some of you will want that, this would be a great choice. You can turn on the note names for this if you want to, or students can do that. So that can be a really useful addition. And it has this option to mark keys. Now, this means that you can actually uh, click the mark button, select, let's say, C and E and G, and it, the website will remember those three and then it will play those three simultaneously. So this is a great way to hear chords and, um, and use it in that way. Again, this one can be played with computer keys. So again, it's a um, nice, useful one. Now in the guide, uh, you might be able to see on the screen there, this is one of five virtual instruments that this website has. So they have a piano, a guitar, a bass guitar, drum machine, and a metronome. That's not really an instrument, but there's a metronome there too. Now, the next piano, virtual piano that I want to share with you is called Shared Piano. And this one's really new, came out, I think it was maybe about two or three weeks ago now. 
And some of you may think, well, this looks a little bit like the Chrome Music Lab and you would be right if you think that because it is from that same group of people. So this is called Shared Piano and I would love to have a go with this with someone else. I may line up a few people, uh, friends of mine who are online in different countries because what you can do is someone can open up the website and then send the link to the page that they're on to a friend. And then that friend joins in and you, you are then both viewing and playing the same keyboard at the same time. And you can do this with up to 10 people. Now, uh, my son Josh and I tested this out just last night because I hadn't actually tested it, uh, playing it with two different devices. We were in the same house and, in fact, in the same room. We were on separate devices, so we were on the same internet connection even. So it was really pretty good. There was hardly any delay between what each of us were doing. I'd really love to test it out with people in different houses and also in different countries maybe or different locations at least. It's uh, a great thing because you can each also select a different playback sound. So I can have the drum kit selected. There's actually a drum kit in there. I can have the drum kit selected and play a pattern while someone else plays a keyboard part. And there are a few different sounds. I think there's from memory strings and woodwind and piano, maybe organ. I can't remember all of them, but multiple options in there. The only thing you have to do is join with a link. So you don't need to sign in. There's nothing to download. You just send someone the link. And I think that this could be really great. If it works the way it's supposed to work, it could be a really great option uh, for students who are working remotely. And I had a thought that even if you're in that hybrid situation where half your kids are at school and half are at home, maybe there are times where the kids at school can link up with the kids who are at home to give them that connection of being part of the class still and you could play together on this shared keyboard. So please, if anyone tests this out, especially with your students, let me know how it goes. I'd love to, I'd love to just hear. Uh, one extra thing that you can do is once you've played some stuff, um, it shows that graphic notation moving up the screen, if you know what I mean. And what you can do is actually scroll back up on your screen and then move downwards to replay what you've done. It's kind of weird and it's very difficult to explain without showing you, but just have a go. Just know that when you've played some stuff, scroll up and then you'll be able to replay what you've already performed in there. Now, I don't see at this point in time, it's in, it's, it's in a beta mode at the moment. I don't see at this time a way to record what you're doing other than it kind of saves what you're doing there and then. But I think once you leave that instance of, you know, your your use of that shared piano, that it's going to go away. So um, if you want to actually record what you're doing, a screencasting tool would be great to do that. I'm going to talk about those a little bit later in this session. Uh, you can turn note names on and off. I'll just mention that. And you can actually change the size of the keyboard itself from two octaves only up to seven octaves. So it looks quite long on the screen there at the moment, but you can actually change it down to just two octaves if you want to have less notes for kids to choose from. I just glanced at the chat window. Laura says, oh my goodness, kids will love this. I hope so. I think so. <laughs> and the other cute thing I will just say, once you join a session, you get randomly assigned a little animal. And so you're either like the bunny or the pig or I don't know, I can't remember the options, but kind of like cute little icons on the screen. So it's nice. Okay, moving on. Keyboard. This one's descriptively called Keyboard, and this is one of the Google Creativity experiments. Now, I wanted to highlight this one and the next um, the next tool that I'm going to show as well, because these are perfect for accessibility uh, students. So, this is a, a keyboard which will actually be played by tracking your body movements. So, you launch the website. It it says, I need to use your webcam and you need to give it permission, otherwise it's not going to work. So you give it permission to use the webcam and then the website sees you. Now, if you can see on that, the right-hand side where I've got the picture there, that is me in the background. And you'll notice there's a blue line going from uh, my head through, actually, no, my neck uh, up to the E note on the keyboard. Now, that is because the website is tracking my movement. And as I move around behind that keyboard, it moves the, the tracking uh, line 
to the next note. Whichever direction I move around in, it will play the note that my head is pointing to. So this is a really great tool and and it's not just for special needs students. You can use this with anybody. I found it fascinating to use as an able-bodied adult and I think it would be fantastic with really young students too for them to experiment. Um, And you just don't need those uh, dexterity uh, finger skills. What do you call it? What's the word? Um, Motor skills, that's the one. So what you can do is go into the website, you can choose a playback sound, marimba or piano, there's a few options in there. You can set up a scale, so you can leave it on a pentatonic scale or have a major scale and there's a few other options there too. You can say how many notes you want on the screen, so there's just five showing there but you can have more. I think you can have up to 14 in total. And lastly, you can say whether you want to play the keyboard with your mouse and computer keyboard or by tracking your body. And you can even then go into the settings for that and say, I want to track through my nose or my wrist or elbow or knee or ankle. So this is really great. You can adapt it to whichever student is using the tool. Lastly, there's also some voice activation options. I think in this one, I've written down for this one, and now that I'm looking at it, uh, I'm not quite entirely sure, but uh, it might be just the next one. But voice activation means that you can change the settings by speaking to the website rather than having to go and use your mouse and change them that way. I've got another picture of this just on the next screen just to show you so you can see in a bit more detail. So this is when it's set up with more notes on the keyboard and you can see the settings that you can choose from down the left-hand side. So you can choose the root note, how many notes are showing, the body tracking settings and so on. Really great tool, um, fantastic, great fun to play with uh, and, and just super useful. Now the next one is also from the same collection of Google Creatability Experiments and this one is called Body Synth. Now, this works in a similar way, except that instead of seeing a keyboard on your screen, uh, you're actually playing chords by an instrument that you choose, and it's tracking, again, body movements to do that. So you you essentially move around, and you can see it. it's picking up my head and my arms and my sort of the top across my shoulders, and as you move, it will activate the chords to play. Now you can change the motion sensitivity of this. So if you want it to be activated by very small movements, you can do that or you can just have it set to be activated by larger movements that you do. There are a choice of playback sounds and you can choose the chord that you're playing and a few other options as well. So that's that's those two. Um, The Google Creatability Experiments, there are more in the set. So this is just two out of, mm, I want to say, about seven or eight different tools. Um, Some of the others are fantastic as well, and they're all in the guide, well worth exploring those as well. Okay, I want to talk about this one, and I think uh, I feel like this is a very underrated and underused free online keyboard And I'm definitely going to be doing some more things with this in the next 12 months. So this is called Accordion, and it's kind of like the word accordion, but QWERTY referring to your computer keyboard. So it's Accordion. And this is where you can use your keyboard, your computer keyboard as an instrument. This one is a little bit different. So it is an online virtual keyboard instrument but this is not one where you will see the keys of a, a of a keyboard like the white and black notes this is where you're actually using your computer keyboard to play different notes that you want to play and the the setup of your keyboard if if you can see on the screen there and I do have a bigger picture in a moment but if you can see on the screen there If you can see the letters, they are not the normal letters that are mapped out on the picture of that computer keyboard there. Across the bottom, I've got C, D, E, G, A, C, D, E, G, A. So this is set up to play notes of the pentatonic scale in C major, and the notes are repeated throughout the keyboard layout. So I can play different octaves in different places on my computer keyboard. And it does take a little bit of getting used to, particularly if you're someone like me who is a keyboard player. Um, I think kids are probably going to get into this or get used to this much more quickly. But you can use your keyboard as this instrument. Now, the really unique thing about this is that you can embed 
any YouTube video you like into the website. I chose to embed uh, one of the Trolls songs, um, Can't Stop the Feeling. So that's why you can see the picture of the Trolls up the top there. So you basically paste in the website, uh, the video URL. It brings it up on the Accordion website and then you can play along with the video. Now, this is really cool and this means that you can actually choose some settings so that they match what, what's in the video. So I've set this one to be the major scale that's used. I've set the scale to be major pentatonic and I've set it to have a root note of C. And this all adjusts what happens on the computer keyboard when I go to play along with the video. Now, you can set this up with the video link and all of those settings, the scale type, the scale itself, the root note and so on, and even the playback sound that's used. You can set that up all ahead of time and send that as a link to your students so that when they bring it up, all of that is set up ahead of time and they don't need to go and change the settings. So I love this option. So you don't need to say to them, okay, go and embed this video. I want you to set this as this. I want you to change the root note to C. You can do that for them and then just send them the link and say, right, you're going to play along with whatever, whatever. Play along with the chorus, improvise something over the bridge section, uh, I want you to see if you can work out the melody, all of those things you can do. And it's just lots of fun. And I think there's so many ways that you can use this. Fantastic for composition, improvisation, uh, simple play along. Transcription would be a great thing, just getting them to work out the notes of something. I don't know if any of you are using this already, but I just think it's a, a great tool. So as I mentioned, I'm going to definitely be doing more with this over the next uh, year or so. It's been around for quite some time and I just haven't, um, I haven't made a lot of resources to go with it, but this is going to be one of my next things. So um, if you're a community member, you can look out for this in the coming months. <laughs> I'll show you just quickly a bigger picture of that same screen there. So you can see the, the drop down menus at the top there. That's where you change your settings and the sound uh, option is in the, the drop down menu at the very bottom. When you go to this website initially, you'll see uh, they've hand picked a video for you just as an example. I think it's usually a James Brown one. So that will be set up for you, but that doesn't mean you have to only use that one. Just know that you can paste your own URL in and change all of those settings yourself. Do you love this one? Who loves this one? <laughs> All right, let's go on to creating teaching resources. So again, this is one of my favorite things at the moment, mainly because I'm running this Canva course and it's just been so much fun. So I want to just highlight today uh, some of these creating teaching resource tools. So Canva being the first one, I'm going to talk about remove.bg, which is a website. Uh, we're going to talk about the Word Art website and Bingo Baker. So starting off with Canva, Canva, again, has been around for a while and it's a an online design tool. So this is a place where you can go and you can set up a design like a presentation or a poster or a worksheet or something from scratch or a social media post and you can basically create whatever you want to go into that design and then either print it out or download it in a digital format and um, many other things. Now, Canva has been around for quite some time and ha has always had a free basic plan. And then they've had a pro version as well, which gives you access to extra resources and extra features. But what they did last December was make that pro version or pretty much that pro version. It's not identical, but they've made a version of that pro account totally free for educators. So this means you instantly get access to a huge, and when I say huge, I mean huge, huge library of clip art and photos and templates to use and videos and stock music and lots and lots of other things. This is the reason that I love Canva so much is that all of those things are inside the tool. So usually when you're designing something, I mean, I've used PowerPoint and Keynote a lot to do this over time. And I love both of those tools. And I know a lot of you use Google Slides. And again, Google Slides can be great for this. 
and you can set up things. And then what you have to do if you're using any of those three options is to go and find your clip art elsewhere and import it into those tools. Or you do a Google search within Google Slides and the, the, the options are very limited. So what Canva has is everything inside Canva itself. So most of the time you don't need to go anywhere. You just say, I want a picture of a ukulele. You search for ukulele in the Canva library and it pops up and you add it to your design and you can even change the color of it and the size and do all these other things and it's transparent already. So this is why it's such a useful tool and such a great time saver. So there are photos in there and templates and so on. And um, what I decided late last year was that I, I really wanted to show teachers how useful I thought Canva was by doing a course on it. And then it became free for educators. So the course became even more exciting and important <laughs> because I thought, well, this is great timing. Now teachers will get access to all of those extra things as well. So we've, we've been running this course, or I've been running this course for the past, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks now and uh, releasing modules uh, every couple of days. The group of teachers doing the course, it's been such a refreshing place to hang out for the last little while. It's just been so joyful and fun and creative and everyone's sharing all of these designs. And the thing that's come out of this that I had no idea that would happen is that because everyone's making posters and worksheets, as an example, and sharing them in the group, all the other members see those posters and worksheets and everything else and say, oh my gosh, I could really use that for my classroom. Do you mind sharing the template? And so everyone's sharing templates with each other. So one of these sort of unexpected offshoots of this course has been that it's been a great repository of sharing of resources. So lots of people are getting stuff ready for their new school year in a very quick way. So I want to show you this picture. This is what it looks like inside Canva. And um, this is one of the examples in the course for Module 5. Uh, one of the projects is to make your own virtual classroom. And I know lots of you have been doing this in Google Slides. And Google Slides does the job just fine. It's just that in Canva, you have access to so many more things to add to your picture. So um, I, I did mine in there. This was an example I had where my bitmoji is like flaked out on the floor. <laughs> but uh, you can see on the, the left side, I've searched for the word percussion. And this is just a tiny bit of the percussion pictures that pop up for things that I can add into my picture there. So the types of things, if you want to explore Canva, go ahead and grab a free account first. And then you request to upgrade to the education account, which is free, but you need to fill out a form. Um, I will actually uh, provide the link to that in, I'll add that to the Wakelet collection too. So these are the types of things that you can create, posters, uh, digital reward badges, we've been creating those, that's been lots of, uh, lots of fun. And they even have videos inside Canva too. So what you can do, it's a way of creating very simple videos and I like to think of them as maybe videos that you'll use to promote a school event or the upcoming school year. We've actually had a lot of teachers in the, the course um, creating uh, what's coming in music for 2021 and they've been making these sort of preview videos of, of the fun things that are going to happen in music class so so it's just a great tool to explore I think it's um, not nearly well known enough amongst teachers as a great tool to create resources so go and explore that and if you do want to join the course, we, we have, I've released all the modules now. It's not really too late to join. If you want to join, please feel free to. Um, I have popped a link. Actually, I think there's a link on the page where you're all watching this website down the bottom. If you're interested just to find out more about the course, do check that out. Now, one other tool that's really useful when you're creating resources is this website. So a lot of the time you'll find a great picture that you want to use in a resource and maybe you're working with something with a coloured background and you want to add this picture over the top of the background, but it has a white background on the picture. And when you add it to your coloured background, it doesn't look cool because you've got a thing with a white square around it and that's really annoying. So what this website does, and it's totally free and it does work, I've put auto magically, it literally works auto magically. You pop your image into this website and it magically removes the background for you and then you download the new version with a transparent background. So let's say it was a picture of a treble clef there's a white square around when you've got it on your desktop. You'll upload that to this website 
it will remove all of the white around behind the treble clef and then you'll download it as a transparent image. Super useful tool. I will actually say, and I don't think I put this in the guide, but I will actually say there is another website, that a tool that they've developed as well, the same people, which is called, uh, it's something about removing the background of a video. Now, I haven't tested this one out. I'm curious to know how this works, but um, I'm, yeah, it, I think it's supposed to give you like a green screen effect without a green screen. So I'm going to go and test that out, but uh, definitely works really well with images. Now, the next one I want to talk about, this is not a new website at all, but again, I wanted to highlight this because I think uh, there's a lot of teachers who probably don't know about it. And this is a website that will create word art for you. So what you do is you go to the website, you enter a list of words, and there have been a few tools that will do this over the years, but I love this one the best. This one has lots of options for you. So you enter your list of words. So let's say, um, and, and you can use this as a teacher creating something for a poster or some other resource as a decoration, or you might actually get students to do this as an assignment. So let's say you've been talking about, um, let's say, let's pick something, uh, the orchestra, and you might add a list of words into the website, which are all words to do with the orchestra. So it could be names of instruments, it could be the word conductor, um, lots of other things like that. So you make a big list of words, and then you hit, uh, you select a shape that you want your words to go into. You can choose things like font and colors and layout and so on, and you hit the visualize button. And it's a red button on the right-hand side that you can see there, visualize, and as soon as you've clicked that button, the website takes all of your words and makes it into this picture. So it's very cool, very um, very easy to do and get a great effect quite quickly. So the one that you can see on the screen there, I just did that quickly last night as an example. I chose to use a bird shape, which is in their collection of shapes that you can choose from. The bird shape itself has different colors in the shape when you're seeing the preview of what this shape is going to be. And so when you generate your picture with your words, it actually replicates the colors of the original shape in the picture. So that's why it's got a black eye and a yellow beak and yellow feet there. So Great tool. There are many, many ways to customise what it comes up with. So it has a font set by default, but you can go in. This is one part of the list of fonts that you can see on the left-hand side there. You can choose a different font if you want, and you can actually get into very nitty-gritty settings about which words you want to be bigger or smaller. Do you want one main word in the middle uh, and so on? So there's a lot of ways you can get nitty-gritty with it, but you don't have to. You can just kind of keep to the basics. Here are a few more word art examples uh, just of things that I've generated uh, quickly. So there's a guitar one which I used blues words for on the left there. That one in the middle is a, a quaver with music and dance related words in it. This is one where I chose to highlight one single word music and make it big in the middle at the bottom and then have all the other words kind of going around it. The one on the right, the love heart shaped one, uh, instead of words, you can have words and emoji or a little icon pictures. And so I chose to create one with just those uh, little pictures in it and just a couple of, uh, well, three words in the middle there. And the one at the top, headphones shape, talking about uh, dynamics. Very cool. Yep. A few love, love, a bit of love for that in the comments. <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah. Definitely go. I think it's a fantastic assignment for students. Uh, if you've been talking about definitions with them in some area, tempo words or whatever, just, you know, one part of what they do to reinforce what they've learned is just to create a list of words to do with that thing that you've been talking about. So I, I really like this as a tool. All right. And the last one in this category is uh, Bingo Baker. And again, this has been in the guide for years and years, but I really thought it needed a bit of a highlighting. And one of the reasons for highlighting this is that I've been seeing some people who, if you're in that situation where you are doing some teaching still on Zoom or Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or whatever, uh, sometimes you need an engaging activity to do, even though your students are at the other end of the screen. And playing a bingo game could be a fantastic way to engage them. So 
I was thinking about this and I'm like, yeah, bingo and bingo baker is my tool of choice. I love this uh, one. Again, it, it seems like a really simple website, but when you go there and look at all the options for how you can set things up, there's so many cool things that you can do. So once again, you can choose just a list of words. It doesn't have to be pictures. The example you can see on the screen there is images, notation images, which I made. And uh, for, as music teachers, this is a great option is to be able to put images in there, but it could just be words. So you might have words in there. Now, the fact that you can do images as well, this means that you can make it a bit more of a quiz type situation than a straight bingo game. If you know traditional bingo, the person who's calling the bingo game says the number and then you find the number on your card and mark it off. Now, I think for students, the better way is going to be that you're going to say something and they need to look for the equivalent thing on their card. So, for instance, in the thing that you can see here, you're going to say fortissimo. Now, they need to not look for that actual word. They're actually going to look for the symbol that represents that in music. And so that, that's what they need to know. So this is a great testing thing. There's lots of ways you can do this. I've, I've even set up some examples where you could play a snippet of music and they have to identify, uh, for instance, film themes by John Williams. You could have the name of themes in each of the squares. So it could be Jaws and Star Wars and you've got about 100 different scores to choose from, but put all the names into the squares and then play the musical example and when they hear it, then they get to mark it off and hopefully they know. <laughs> hopefully they know what it is so they can mark off the correct one. Now, Bingo Baker is really clever because you put your list of words or images into the tool and when you generate the playing cards for the students, they are generated randomly. No two students will get the same card, which means that you can play Bingo and it's not like person A won't have an identical card to person B. So they're not all going to reach Bingo at the same time it automatically gives you everything randomised and it tells you the probability. It's cut off on the screen a little bit there, but when you have a certain number of words, it tells you the probability of how, how long it will take for someone to get to bingo, probably. <laughs> and so, again, it's just super useful. And also I'll just point out on the right-hand side there, you can see one of the items showing boldly on the screen, which is the minimum there. Now, this is because when you as a teacher are calling out the bingo game, Bingo Baker will actually provide you with a call list. And so you can go through what it shows you is the next thing to call out and you'll know then that you haven't called out the same thing twice. You don't have to keep track necessarily. It will just uh, show you the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and you'll keep uh, calling those things out. If you want a lot of variety in your bingo games, you can actually add more words or symbols or images to your list than there are squares. So 25 you would have maybe as a minimum. And you, you can actually make much smaller cards. You don't have to make ones which are five by five. You've got the option of making really small ones. So if you've got young students, you might want to have three by three, four by four. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can say with 25 squares, you can actually upload uh, 40 different words to fit into those squares. So you'll get a truly randomised game then. All right, Bingo Baker, go and uh, have a look at that. It's it's just fabulous. It's great. Oh, and I will say with Bingo Baker, you can either play, students can play online. They can bring up the bingo card on their uh, laptop or iPad and uh, tap or click on a square to mark it off. And uh, alternatively, you can print it out. So again, I think this is a great tool for those of you in that hybrid situation and who may have some students without access to great technology. All right, let's briefly talk about video creation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these ones because I've done webinars on all three of these things at different times. And I do just want to mention that if you haven't really explored Loom or Screencastify as tools to make tutorial or teaching videos for your students, I can highly recommend looking into those. Both free tools, they both do roughly the same thing. I'll talk about those in a second. And the last one is Flipgrid, which is slightly different, but super, super useful. So Screencastify and Loom, I'm going to lump them together because essentially they do the same thing. You install them as a free Chrome extension 
and you can hit record and you can record anything that's on your screen and you can talk over the top of it. Now, in addition to that, you can turn your webcam on and have you showing on the screen at the same time as your computer screen showing, or you can just have your webcam showing. So because it's so easy to use these, I really think this is a fantastic way to get started quickly with making teaching videos. If you want to have just yourself on the screen, you can put your webcam on, you can sing, you can talk, you can play in front of the camera and the microphone will pick up whatever you're saying or singing or playing, and you've got a quick video that's made. In addition to that, you can talk through things that are on your screen, showing on your screen, whether that's for the purpose of teaching someone how to do something or whether you're providing feedback for someone. So rather than writing out a big, long assessment of something, Sometimes it's really nice just to hit record and talk it through. The student then gets to hear your voice, your tone of voice, um, anything you might want to say that's, that, you know, that it would be hard to put into writing. Um, I use, I actually use Loom most of all, and I use Loom every single day, multiple times every day. Uh, so when, if you're a member of my online community, you will know this because <laughs> Most of my answers to questions that people ask inside the forums of my community, so someone will get in there and say, hey, um, I need help doing this or I can't work this out, I will 90% of the time hit record and talk through my answer, either showing them something on the screen or I simply talk to the camera. It's so much quicker for me to give feedback or advice or answer a question that way than it is to write it all out. Sometimes I write it out, but most of the time I just find it easier to record a video and um, especially if I'm demonstrating something, oh, okay, you need to click here or you need to do this. Much easier for me to just show them on the screen and do it that way. Now, the reason I love these two is because you get, um, they basically store your videos for you and you get a link to share them instantly, especially Loom. This is why I use Loom more. Uh, you get a link instantly and you can just send that link to someone. So you finish recording. You don't need to download your video, export your video, upload it somewhere. It's just all done in one go and it's just super fast. And you can also down your videos if you want to, download your videos if you want to. All right, Flipgrid, I know a lot of you know Flipgrid now and if you haven't explored Flipgrid, you may know of Flipgrid and it is really worth exploring. It's one of those things I think where it, it's kind of hard to get a handle on what it is and why it's so useful and how it works until you just have a play. So if you haven't done that yet, just go and have a play with it. I have a whole free webinar that I ran a couple of months ago, three or four months ago, whenever it was, uh, and you can go back and watch that. And that is a, a good walkthrough of how it works and why you might want to consider using it. But the reason I wanted to mention it is uh, as a teacher, music teacher particularly, it does two things really, really well. One is that you can make, you can use the Flipgrid inbuilt camera to make your own teaching videos. So you might choose to use uh, this to make your teaching videos or some of your teaching videos instead of Loom and Screencastify. And I actually think they work all well with each other. I wouldn't use just one or the other. Sometimes Flipgrid makes a better choice and sometimes Loom or Screencastify does that. But one of the main things is for music teachers, I know a lot of you want to gather playing assessments from students and you want to get videos of them playing their latest, uh, you know, piece or part of their piece or whatever it is you're working on. And gathering students' videos can be a really tough task, except Flipgrid makes it super easy. You set up a place where the students are going to send their videos to, the students hit the big green plus button on that topic. So it's a topic that you set up which says uh, please play your latest um, piece, whatever we've worked on this week, and the students will hit that green plus button, record themselves on whatever device they have. It can be any device and as soon as they're finished recording it goes straight into the place where you are gathering the videos together. It goes straight into your topic and you can easily see all the videos in one place. So I can't say enough how, um, how much easier this makes that process 
than doing things like getting kids to record on their phone and then they have to export it or download it or airdrop it or whatever system you're going to use. And then you set up like a Google Drive folder and they all send it to the Google Drive folder and then people's permissions are not correct. Like it just saves all that hassle. So I really um, can recommend that. Okay, going to head on to compose and create category. And I think this is the second last category. And I'm going to just talk through a few things in this one. Most of these are old favourites. I think all of them are old favourites, actually. <laughs> so, uh, you will have heard me talk about them before if you've uh, been to other things that I've run. And I'm going to start off with the song maker from Chrome Music Lab. That's had a little popularity thing this year, hasn't it? Uh, Incredibox, definitely an old favourite. Groove Pizza, Beepbox and Band Lab. So the Chrome Music Lab is a collection of interactive music tools and they're all fantastic. But the one that lots of people have been on this year or have discovered this year is the Song Maker. The Song Maker is their more recent addition to the collection of Chrome Music Lab tools. And it's just really fabulous. The thing I think most of us love about it is it's it's a clean and simple interface. It's easy to use. You don't need to work stuff out. Like you can just work it out. You click on the screen and it makes notes. <laughs> That's just it. It's just really easy to use. So you can use this to create melodies and actually rhythms as well. It has a rhythmic component to it. But you basically add sounds by clicking on the screen. And one thing I love, I, I have an obsession with colour and it's very brightly coloured. So this it looks visually appealing. I think it's a great way to uh, get students to maybe recreate a song that they know or to compose something freely from scratch or to add to something that you've already started. So you can actually set up a template for them and then they add to it. So that's a great way to get them into composing or making up something of their own. And it's a, a really good way to introduce graphic notation. So if you're teaching students, you can see the representation of pitch going up or down. Uh, you can see notes being played simultaneously. It shows on the screen and it's just got that nice visual look to it. Anything that you create on this, and again, there's no login required to this. I know it's such a simple thing, but that is such a barrier at times, I know, for many, is that you go to a free website, oh, I've got to log in or set up and register and I don't know my password. You just visit this one, like I think pretty much all of the other ones I've shown you today, with the exception perhaps of Flipgrid, you just go there and you use the website and once you've created something on here, you can just save a link to the thing you've created. So if a student makes something, they can send you a link to their work. When you visit the link, it's going to open up exactly what they've made and you can hit play on the screen and play it back. So it's a fabulous tool. So um, coming up to May the 4th, Be With You, Star Wars Day, I did actually put together some lesson plans for the Chrome Music Lab song maker. And I made them Star Wars related and it was all, all to do with recreating the Star Wars theme song in the song maker. I've put a link to that in the Wakelet collection. So if you want to download a copy of those, if you didn't already, they, um, they did the rounds a lot online and uh, it, it was hugely popular when I published it. And then someone put in one of the Facebook groups that I'm in, someone said on May the 4th, someone actually said, I wonder how many um, teachers have their students doing Katie's lessons today <laughs> in Songmaker. It just made me laugh because I think at that time there was like hundreds of downloads on it and it was very funny. Uh, again, my plan is to make more resources for the members of the community. So again, if you're listening, uh, you can expect to see some more of these templates and lesson ideas for the Songmaker. It's such a simple tool, but I just think it has a lot of scope. And often simple is better. It just takes away a lot of um, complexities from using technology. So it's a great thing. Now, Incredibox uh, really is an old favourite. Incredibox was in the very first version of the guide that I published in 2014 and it's been around, uh, I've been showing it in workshops since 2009, I think when it first appeared on the scene. And it has had, over time, it, it's been a free web version. 
They've also introduced an iPad app, which is a paid app. And the website itself was Flash-based and they worked very hard uh, in the last couple of years to update it, knowing that Flash would go away. And so the current version on the website is built with HTML5 and so it works and it will survive the end of this year. So it's an updated version. Now, when you go to the website version, I, I keep seeing a lot of people comment and saying, oh, it's not free anymore. You just need to make sure you're selecting the ones that are free. So Incredibox has different flavors. There are different versions of Incredibox. And if you've never used it, basically you'll open up one of the options, one of the styles. And so you'll go to the website, choose one to get started with. And there are some dudes on the screen. Actually, there's one dude to start with. And you drag one of those icons down the bottom of the screen. You drag onto the first guy that you've got onto the screen and he starts beatboxing or singing or something, whatever you've chosen for him to do. And then another guy will turn up on the screen and you'll add a sound to him and you'll keep adding until you've filled your screen up. So the picture you can see there, I've got seven guys on the screen and they're all doing different musical patterns that all fit beautifully together and they're kind of cool and funky sounding. So when you choose uh, to launch in Box, there are multiple options in the menu to choose from in terms of styles uh, that you can open up. Some of them are free on the web version and then some of them are not. And it will say these ones are on the paid iPad app. I think from memory they might have a lock uh, picture on them. Anyway, but just do know that some of them are available for free. If you want to get access to all of the other ones, uh, you'll need to uh, get the iPad app. Earlier this year, they actually gave access to the paid ones for free on the website version, but only for a short time. But that was cool. I got to explore a couple I hadn't really spent time on. Like there's um, there's an Indian version. I uh, can't remember what that one's called. And there's a Brazil version, which is my favorite one. Really fabulous. So again, uh, this one's great for teaching beatboxing and acapella singing, introducing kids to those con uh, concepts. Uh, you can teach arranging and DJ skills. You can create backing tracks with it. Um, and one of the great things is you can record your performance of what you want these guys to do. And that's the thing that adds a bit of meaning to it in my mind. Now, I've had a number of blog posts and lesson plans over the years, which I've published, and I've put those on that Wakelet collection for you if you want to uh, find out more about those. Okay, so uh, Groove Pizza, again, an old favourite of mine. Groove Pizza is one of these other just simple concepts. It's an online drum sequencer in a circular shape which looks like a pizza. And the rhythm, the playback line goes around the circle and you can add sounds to that pizza pie and it will play them back for you. So you can make really simple drum patterns. You can adjust the playback sound, the tempo. You can change the amount of swing in the pattern. If you've got eighth notes in there, you'll hear the swing or no, not 16th notes, just 8th notes, I think. Um, you can hear the swing in the pattern. And again, it's just a great tool. So things I like to use this for are creating drum backings. You can get kids to uh, recreate a drum pattern that they know. You could get them to recreate a hand clapping pattern that they've learned in Groove Pizza. And you can save a link to your composition you can download your composition and then use it in other programs and again it's got lots of scope there for lessons so a nice simple one and once again I've given you some links in that Wakelet collection for uh, well particularly one called Rap My Name which is a great place to use this it's a lesson plan about creating a rap. Beatbox is another old favourite of mine. Um, it does not have an exciting graphic design <laughs> interface, but, you know, it's free, so that's okay. And this is a fantastic tool for creating video game style compositions. It doesn't have to be a video game theme that you use this for. It's a, it's a basic step sequencer where, again, you click on the screen to add sounds, you play back your pattern, you build up your, your piece of music, but it has this Mario Brothers kind of flavour to it. And so I love it as a way to create video game themes. It's lots of fun. Now, this is on the surface. It looks like a very simple, basic tool, but there are so many things you can customise and change and preferences you can set. And actually, 
the whole bottom section is a way of creating, if you want to, quite a complex arrangement. Um, you don't have to use it in that way at all, but you can do. So I've used it in the past to create a video game theme and then downloaded the theme from Beepbox and then opened up video editing software and put footage from Mario Brothers Level 1 and the theme that's been created in Beepbox in together. So you can do your own sort of uh, like a film scoring exercise, but for video games and, and use this tool that way. And uh, on the screen there, you can see two notes that are like look like a glissando and they literally play back like that. But in a video game style, they've got this sound to it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's lots of fun. And again, just really good to explore that one. All right, the last one in this category I'll mention is BandLab. And uh, I know a lot of you are looking for something like GarageBand or GarageBand to use with your students. And BandLab is one that is completely free to use. And it allows you to record audio. You can record MIDI or virtual instruments in there. And it works uh, in your browser. So it's a browser-based uh, option. Now, Soundtrap also appears in my ultimate free guide, and I really love Soundtrap. But Soundtrap, if you want to use that one, the best way to use Soundtrap is the paid version. And I love Soundtrap because it offers maybe a little bit more different features uh, slightly to BandLab, uh, and you are best using the paid version of Soundtrap if you're going to use it with your students. It creates your own walled environment to use and uh, it's a fantastic tool. But I did want to mention BandLab um, if it's not in your budget to get something like Soundtrap. BandLab is a great option as well. So go and explore that. If you're looking for an option uh, for something for Chromebooks, this would be a great place uh, to, to go. Now, I need to tell you that when you go and look up BandLab, you need to go to the Education BandLab website. So BandLab EDU, if you just search for, I think it's edu.bandlab, I've put the correct link anyway for you in that Wakelet collection. But the other one, the bandlab.com website, is a place where you get the, the sort of the, the general public version of BandLab. And it's not so safe for students to use because it, it, it's more like a social sharing website. So BandLab, the education version, is the one that you need to look up there. All right, just briefly on the orchestra, I just wanted to mention uh, three different websites in this category. And I think this is probably the most common one that I've seen people discuss uh, with regard to Flash disappearing. There's a few orchestral type websites that people have been using for years, which are Flash based, and they're probably just going to disappear at the end of this year. Um, and the main reason is, you know, that lack of time to develop them for the people who, who run the website. So, here are a couple of options for you. So I just want to briefly show uh, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra Learn, Inside the Orchestra and the Dallas Symphony Orchestra Kids website. So first of all, DSO Kids, again, DSO Kids has been in my guide and I've been showing in workshops, I think probably for more than 10 years now. The website has had a big refresh. It looks beautiful and it's bright. Um, what The image you can see there on the screen is actually advertising an, an upcoming concert uh, actually may pass now but anyway uh, that's what's on the the front page of their their website there but you can click through to the menu options of listen and learn and activities and for teachers and so on up the top of the website and you'll find access to lots of different resources so they have a series of like games and interactive things that students can do they have some orchestra seating charts for different style orchestra or different start size orchestras they have lesson plans and activities and one of the things that i've always loved about this website is there are a collection of uh, biographies for composers which are written in simple language so rather than looking up Prokofiev on Wikipedia and getting pages and pages to sift through, you just get this nice, simple and to the point biography that you can share with students. So that's one of the things I've always loved about this website. They also have instrument samples. So you can click on, you know, the flute and hear the flute play and, and that sort of thing too. So it's still a great website, definitely worth checking out. This one is one that's newer to me. 
it, it possibly has been around for a long time, but I have had not discovered it until a few months ago. It's called Inside the Orchestra. And this one has a series of online music games. There's a, like a musical memory. Um, I've put Bing. That should be Bingo. <laughs> uh, you, there's little activities to compose a rhythm or to compose a song and there are some listening things. Um, with these websites, I usually go and test things out to see how they work and I found myself um, two days ago playing an entire game of musical memory. It's that memory cards game, you know, where you've got to match things up. And after doing like the first two sets, I probably didn't need to actually match up the entire lot in the game, but, you know, you get obsessive with it and you have to finish off the game. So there I was and then I thought, okay, I really need to like do some work now. But that was that. Um, it also has, this website has a great set of at-home music activities and I think that they put this together in response to lots of kids being at home. And there are some really lovely um, like DIY, make your own instrument links and uh, activities that you can do. There's a massive full activity guide section. If you go there, you'll just get lost for days in looking through all these different activities. And there are sort of some formal lesson plans for teachers, but there are also things which are aimed more at, I think, parents with young kids um, and so you can just go and explore all of those. But fabulous website, uh, lots of educational videos as well. The last one in this category, MSI Learn, is a much more simple one. And again, sometimes simple is what you need. So this one has an interactive orchestra seating chart. And this is the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. So this is my local orchestra. And you can open up the interactive seating chart and you can click on the different sections of the orchestra to hear them play. You can click through and explore individual instruments and families and there's some written information on the page and some listening examples and so on. So that one's just a useful one. And again, the graphic design is really lovely. It's just uh, bright and colourful and nice to look at. All right, I'm going to head into my last section now. I think I had one more than I thought I did. <laughs> this is the miscellaneous section. There's only three things that I want to talk about in this section. And the three things are Wakelet, which I've talked about already a little bit today, and Jamboard, which is an online whiteboard, and the Transpose Chrome extension, just because I think it's a useful thing to know about. So Wakelet that I've mentioned uh, as a place that I've collected some links for today is somewhere where you can share a collection of links all to do with one topic. You can curate things. You can uh, gather together multimedia in one place. So Wakelet, if you've used Pinterest, it kind of looks and feels a little bit like Pinterest in a way in that you set up a collection or a category for links and then you can add things to it. So, for instance, if you were teaching instruments of the orchestra to your students, you might set up a Wakelet collection, which is instruments of the orchestra, and then on that collection you're going to add useful YouTube videos, you might add a link to a web page that you think is useful for students to visit, you might add a link to a PDF worksheet that you've created, you might write a text box on the page which tells the students uh, a little bit about what the unit of work is going to be about. And you can basically add almost anything you can think of to your Wakelet collection. You can also organise your collection in different layouts. So the one you can see on the screen there is kind of like everything all at once, like a Pinterest board really. But you can have things all in a row um, heading down the page in one column. And that's the way I've got your links for today. So you'll see that I've added a text box which acts as a heading and then underneath that there's a group of links and then there'll be another text box with a heading and then a group of links. So you can have your Wakelet collection looking uh, in different ways, different formats, depending on what you want to use it for. Now this is really useful for using as a place uh, for students to create digital portfolios. So they could use a Wakelet collection as their digital portfolio and they add all of their evidence of learning to this Wakelet collection. So let's say they're going to do a unit of work, um, maybe it's uh, film scoring, and they can set up a Wakelet collection which is film scoring and in that they can add a link to an essay that they've written, they can add a link to a video that they've analysed, they can add a link to a composition that they've done and uploaded to share somewhere. 
all of it can go into one place and it's just a really simple, easy way to gather all of these things together. Wakelet, again, it's kind of one of those things that you just don't know how useful it is until you try it. So my advice would be go and give it a go. I'm using it for almost all of my workshops and conferences and presentations now as the place, uh, the, the method of sharing links to all the things I talk about. I just find it a really quick way to do that and easy way. You can also have a Wakelet collection, which is a collaborative one. So if you want to share or create links um, to something together with someone else, so if, if you're a teacher and you have a colleague, that would be a great, a great way to do it. Students could also work together in that same way. Okay, Jamboard. Jamboard, again, I've brought into this session um, mainly because of the online remote learning type situation that many are in or still in or will be in. And this is a, it's simply a whiteboard that you open up on your screen and then you can draw on the screen. But you can also do additional things. So the screenshot you can see there is a Jamboard that I just chucked a few things on. But you can see I've brought in an image of a stave. I brought in an image of a treble clef to put on that stave and I brought some images in of individual notes to drag onto the stave as well. Now the one at the top, I've got the stave and I've got the treble clef there but I hand drew those notes, they're a bit, <laughs> a bit dodgy looking but I took the pen tool and drew on the stave to put those notes on there. In addition to drawing on the screen or putting images in there in order to talk about them and explain concepts or, or whatever it is you need to do on your whiteboard, you can also create sticky notes and put text on them too. So that's what you can see on the right-hand side. There's also a laser pointer. So if you were talking to students and you had this showing, you could choose the laser pointer in order to point out certain things you know, on the screen that you're talking about. And again, it's a collaborate, there's a collaborative option if you want there to be. So this is a super useful thing. Jamboard is a physical thing as well as an online whiteboard um, app. So when you Google Jamboard, you might find you're coming across the physical item called Jamboard, but you can just use this on its own without owning the actual Jamboard itself. You can just open it up as a whiteboard tool. So I know some of you are looking for that. It's not the whiteboard to end all whiteboards, but it's just a great simple tool. <coughs> Excuse me. Last one, the transpose extension. So um, I learned about this one at the Texas Music Educators Conference um, when my friend Amy Burns came down the corridor between sessions and said, oh my gosh, I've just learned about this very cool Chrome extension <laughs> called transpose. So thank you, Amy, for mentioning it to me. It was very funny at the time and uh, essentially you'll install this Chrome extension and this is a useful like a playback control panel for when you have a YouTube video open and it doesn't have to be just on YouTube. It could be on Vimeo or other services and this even works for Spotify if you're using the browser-based version of Spotify. So you install the extension and when you open up the extension, you can see that panel on the screen there uh, basically, you've got some controls to change the playback of whatever it is that you're listening to or watching. So you can transpose the video, you can change, you can make it go higher or lower. You can actually fine tune the pitch as well. So if your instrument is not quite in tune with the YouTube video, you can fine tune it, just go a little bit flatter or a little bit sharper. Um, you can change the playback speed of the video. Now, I know you can do that in YouTube anyway, but this gives you really quick access to that function and lastly and this is probably my favorite thing is that you can set up a practice loop so this means that you can play the video through you can wait till it gets to the beginning of the chorus you can mark that spot in the video you can let it play to the end of the chorus and mark that spot and that is your loop you've set up the beginning and the end of your loop and then when you play that it will play through at the end of the chorus, it will loop back to the beginning of the chorus and just keep playing that little section. You can even make your loop just one or two bars long if you want to practice a short part. So this becomes a really useful playback and practice tool for yourself or for students, whether you're using it in class in front of the group or whether they're using it for themselves. So just a really useful one, definitely worth downloading and installing. 
Okay, that's it for today. I'm going to uh, finish up here and I'm just going to give you a couple more links. Uh, I don't want to confuse things with too many links, but uh, the PD certificate for today, if you want to download a, a professional development certificate of attendance, you can do that here at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash PD free tech, PD free tech at the end. I'm going to open up for question answer time uh, in just a second. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll just go back to me on the screen. But um, that's the PD certificate link. The Wakelet link with everything I've mentioned today, I, I think Martin's just pasted it again in the window there. So I'll pop that up again in a second as well. But in the next uh, little while, a replay link will be sent out within around 24 hours so if you didn't catch the whole of this session you can watch the rest of it or the first part or watch it again and uh, you can share that with friends and colleagues if you want to as well the same page that will have the web webinar replay will also be a download link for a copy of my slides that I've shown today and there will also be the link to the PD certificate form and I'll pop a link to the free guide itself. So here's again the link for the free guide. This is the entire collection of free resources uh, for this year. And so it's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash free guide 2020. All right, I will stop sharing my screen and um, head over and just check out the chat window. I hope you've all been well in the chat window while I've been doing this. It's always a bit surreal. All right, let me get out of that and go back to me. That's not it. There we go. Back to me. Excellent. I hope you found that useful. Were there things that were new to you? <laughs> I just, I'm just, joy I just glanced in the chat window and someone said they've got so many tabs open. <laughs> That's cool. That's good. That's great. Great. Excellent. I will scroll back up a little way in the chat window. It does tend to um, move quite quickly. So I will try to catch your question. If you, uh, if you have something you want me to answer and I didn't see it, just type it in again if you, if you can do that. Thank you for all the thank yous. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Great collection of resources. Excellent. Yeah, I hope uh, Chandra, that's, oh, that's a lovely name. Oh, she said it was fantastic. Got so much anxiety about what September will look like, but this is making me feel excited again. That's a lovely comment. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's why I really wanted to make sure that there were some tools today which would help out that um, remote learning situation or hybrid. I think a lot of people are going to do the high, end up doing the hybrid thing. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Eve, Vel, Faith, JJ, oh, JJ's screen. <laughs> That's the one I saw. I have so many tabs open, I don't know where to start. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, guest 9040, something about the summer PD, get the link to the other PD. I'm presuming you mean previous sessions. Yes, I'll grab that and paste that into the window right now. I'll, I'll, I will add a couple of things to the Wakelet board while we're speaking as well. Um, all of the training sessions that I've run in the past, in the past few months particularly, oops, I've just clicked on the wrong thing, <laughs> uh, are on a page on my website which is called Free Training. I've just, I'm just, oh, oh no, Martin's put the other one in. Um, this one that I've just pasted into the chat window is free training, uh, the free training page, and that has links to pretty much all of the things in there. I'm just also checking the um, the YouTube comments. Thank you for anyone who was on there. LM Shackers, I'm thinking that's, is that Lisa? <laughs> Have a glass of wine and relax, says Mary. <laughs> Too early for wine for me. Maybe later tonight though. It's only, uh, it's 11.22 a.m. at the moment, so it might be coffee shortly. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, love to learn about the transpose extension. Oh, that's good because that was the, like the last tiny footnote. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Cynthia. Great. Many things for new, says Lenore. That's good. Thank you, Wendy. 
Wendy Todd <laughs> thrown into the classroom after not having been there for 20 years. That's amazing. Wendy, wow. Yes, Lisa says it's me. Oh, good. <laughs> wow, Wendy, that's phenomenal. You'll be great. You'll be fine. Totally fine. I think anyone who's um, taking the initiative to learn about new things is probably going to be fine. I, do, I don't know. I, I feel like that's a thing. Thank you, Dale. Fantastic resource summaries, Dale says. Sarah says so many new ones. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm – and <laughs> Donna as well. I've been teaching for 30 years, so many new things. <laughs> yeah, it's – it's really hard. Even look, I you know, a lot of people say to me, "How do you keep up with all the things?" I don't. I don't a lot of the time. I I I basically um, just listen out for when people are mentioning things. I don't go and proactively try to keep up with things. They just sort of appear in my Twitter feed or on Facebook. And com going to conferences is really useful. Um, I know that we can't really do that at the moment, but if you get to go to online conferences or do sessions like this. It's often the place that I'll learn about things and uh, it's funny because I think a lot of the time people think everybody knows about a tool already. Like if, you know, I don't know, you, you feel like you don't want to share something because you feel like everyone probably knows it already, even if it's new to you. Share it anyway. That's why today I shared Bingo Baker. It's been in my guide for, forever. Incredibox, I, I keep thinking everybody in the world must know about Incredibox, but every time I show it or share it, I still have people going, oh, wow, that's cool. I've never seen that before. Um, definitely just share things randomly on Twitter or Facebook. The way that you can phrase it, if you're worried about people going, oh, yeah, we all knew about that, I just put something like, wow, I did not, I, I have just discovered today this or I didn't realise how cool Bingo Baker was. You don't even have to say that you only found it today. You can just say, wow, this has been super useful in the last week and you share it and I can guarantee 90% of your friends will go, wow, I had no idea that existed. So do it anyway. Do it anyway. Bridget's looking forward to investigating. Thank you. It's so positive. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> um, tra yeah, transpose. If you guessed whoever says I can't find transpose, the link is in the weight click collection. Go to the weight click collection. That's the first port of, port of call. If you are Googling it, just type transpose Chrome extension and then it will come up. Uh, yeah, I hope to see you at TMEA, whoever that was, in the future too. Is definitely off the cards next next year. I don't even know if they're running it. Actually, are they running it? Um, they're probably considering the online version. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Shirley. I have to transition from a lot of singing to more online tools. Yeah, I know. I think I think you're not alone. Thank you, Marilyn. Chromebooks. Yep. Good. Suzanne asked my microphone. My microphone is a USB microphone. It's an ATR, Audio Technica, ATR2100 is the model, if that's what you're asking about, Suzanne. It's super easy to use. You just plug it in to your laptop in the, the USB port and, yeah, it, it goes well. <laughs> it just works. <laughs> Nothing, no fussing around with settings and things. Oh, I'm missing good good comments here. Sorry, some people saying got lots of good ideas. Um, Shandra said, "Can I edit the video and save it and send it uh, to kids?" No, it, it's kind of um, the transpose Chrome extension just works while you're looking at the video in YouTube. So the kids, you could just tell the student what to choose the settings for in the browser. Like they bring up the video in their browser and and have the Chrome extension and, and change it. You can do that in other software, but that's not the function of this one. So, yep. And, and by other software, like Audacity, for instance, would be that, uh, an option for that. Um, just change the pitch, change the key, whatever. <laughs> Amy says, uh, school district is back in person full-time, five days a week and you're scared. Yeah, I know. I think it's just hard because as teachers, you don't have control over that decision. So if if you are someone with a low autoimmune system, no, you know, function, whatever, um, you just don't get much option with that. Oh, question about, uh, oh gosh, I lost it. Where is it gone? Something about Beat Lab and Isle of Tune. And those are two that I have removed from the guide <laughs> because Flash not working anymore. Um, 
I can't, sorry, I, I missed who asked that. And oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, Dion. Yeah. I've been using some of these and we'll get over the fact that if some are finishing up, yeah, good work. <laughs> I, to be honest, I had the frozen let it go picture in my slides initially. I took it out. But, yes, that just you have to let it go. So, no, Beat Lab and Isle of – Beat Lab, no, and Isle of Tune, no. Neither of those will work. Isle of Tune, you probably know, has an iPad app version, which uh, will work because it's different technology base. Um but Beat Lab, no. But there are lots of things which are kind of similar to Beat Lab, particularly which you could totally substitute. So definitely explore those. I love Tune. I'm sad about because it's very different to everything else. Very, very different. And um, there's nothing to replace that one. We all just have to let it go. <laughs> let it go. Yeah, it's a bit sad. Joan is an old teacher ready to learn some new things. Uh, good work, good work. Uh, Jan, if you want a short video of yourself to start the class while you greet students at the door, what would be your first choice of tech? Um, I Two options, Jan, if you don't mind, two options. Uh, if you want to have, well, either, I would either use Loom or Screencastify. That's not the two options. That's like one or the other. Loom or Screencastify, just open it up, put the webcam on, hit record, do your greeting. Uh, and the other thing is uh, people in my Canva course would tell you to use Canva because there's some really cool things you can do with making short videos and that's what some of them are doing with Canva is actually making a welcome to music class type video and you can add awesome, uh, it's hard to describe without knowing how this works, but you can add awesome like stickers and animations and overlays and there's templates which make it look beautiful and very like a professional video. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you could explore either of those. Thank you, Ruth. Site and webinar have been a huge pickup. Thank you. I'm glad. Martin's confirming what I said about Transpose. Uh, I'm way back in the chat window again now. Sorry. Um, Rosie asking question. Yes, when you use the tr Transpose extension, you can lower the pitch and slow it down. Yep, you can do any or all of the things at once. You could <laughs> you could lower the pitch and slow it down and set up a playback loop. Uh, the, the further away you go from the original everything in the video, the original key, the original speed, it starts to sound kind of crappy, but you would guess that anyway. Um, but, yeah, just have a play. It's, it's really, really good. Thank you, Betsy. She says, I rock. Sarah Benz asks about a Wakelet link. I'm going to guess Martin's pasted that already by the time I get to the bottom of this list, so I'll leave that for a second. Laura's getting 100% online. Yeah. Oh, no. I feel like it, we all thought it was over and we were done with the online, like, yep, tick that box and let's go back to normal now, and that's just not really happening. So it's... Uh, yeah, Susan would love a day training course um, manipulating all of these websites. Yeah, Susan, I have um, – it's funny. So two things on that actually. Uh, I have some training already, more in-depth training about some of the things that I've mentioned today inside the community. So if you're a member or interested in being a member, um, you can explore those. I have a collection that I've called Super Simple Lessons Using Free Websites. And so things like Incredibox, Groove Pizza, Beepbox – I've got more extensive training on each of those things in there and lesson plans to go with it. But that's one of the areas that I'm actually uh, going to make more resources in. I think that will probably be my focus for the next little while is making resources for a lot of these free ones. Just the in-depth stuff, a lot of them are like on the surface, you go, oh, yeah, that looks cool, but it's when you, you know, get into the in-depth stuff, it, it becomes really useful. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to say that's pronounced Karen. Uh, looking for a website or interactive tool that focuses on cultural music and instruments around the world. I do have a suggestion and I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. In the in the big PDF, the ultimate guide to free tech resources, if you're still, still watching, um, there is something in there and I can't remember what it's called. It could be called world music <laughs> or something like that. Um, I have a feeling it might might even be in the orchestral instruments section, which is not quite the right place to put it, but uh, I'll see if I can think of it while I'm still talking. Anyway. <laughs> 
Uh, Annie says, why two microphones? I'm not sure that what that was in regards to. I've just got one microphone here right now. Wendy says, thank you, Kiana. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, thank you. Doug, <laughs> where have I been? <laughs> I've been here, Doug. Where have you been? <laughs> Uh, we can chat about that in the Facebook group for the Canva course. <laughs> it's funny that actually um, sometimes I think like I'm on Facebook in certain music educator groups quite a bit and I'm like, oh, every it's, this sounds terrible. Sometimes I think everyone knows me, <laughs> but then a lot of the time people go, oh, wow, I've just found your website and wow, it's cool. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't really expect everyone knows me. Uh, Caitlin, thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Caitlin, a lot of the ones today are really good for differentiation of age groups and stuff. Monica's going into first year of teaching. Wow. I really feel for people who are going into their first year of teaching at this moment in time. It's just, um, yeah, it's just a bit crazy. But hey, if you can handle the first year in this climate, you'll be fine <laughs> for the rest of your teaching career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Laurie. Thanks, Maggie, Diane. Brielle had a typo, but thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mary's commented on the colour coding, like with the boom whackers. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I love it too. Yeah, it's funny. I think most websites that are using colours in their tools are just going with the boom whacker colours and it just makes it easier for everyone. Oh, transpose is what I've been searching for for a long time, says someone. Great. Thank you. Oh, Kristen, yep, the teacher account on Canva. Yeah, let me just, um, I'm going to grab you a link if you're still there or for anyone watching. Um, let me just talk about that. If you're applying for the Canva account, there's just a couple of useful things for you to know. And I know this now after spending time with lots of people applying for the account. You, so <laughs> just read someone's uh, comment about my Aussie accent. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have an accent. <laughs> um, I can't remember who asked that question now. Now I've just been distracted. Uh, was it someone called Caitlin? Anyway, Canva account, the process is that you go to the Can the regular Canva website and you apply for the free account. Just do that first. I mean, not apply. You set up your free account. So do that first and then there's a page that you can go to. I've just put a link in Canva for Education. Um, actually, I probably should have put the more direct link in here. Uh, that's like their, their promo page. This one here, once you've set up your free account, then you go to this link. And if you don't save the link or can't find it, you basically just uh, search for apply for Canva for Education. So you have your free account, then you fill out the application form to apply for the education version. Now, you need to prove that you're an educator and they ask for proof, as in you have to upload documents. Uh, there's a list of options there and it depends, you know, what country you're in and all that sort of stuff. So you, you have to provide some kind of proof that you are a teacher. If you get knocked back, based on whatever you sent them, if you get knocked back, do follow it up because they have been quite good in, oh, uh, we didn't realise that was a valid qualification document or whatever it is. Just do follow it up and ask them. The thing that I have not yet solved is if you are a private instrumental studio type teacher, those people seem to be getting knocked back. It it's, seems to be fine if you're based at a school, you're, you know, teaching at a school, you've got a, a job at a school. Anyway, give it a go. They're very open and um, helpful and lovely. Now, the, the biggest thing you need to know is once you apply for the account, it does take a little while to come through. And by a little while, it's usually a few days before you get your education account. You will not get an email saying, hey, we've upgraded you to the education account. I think in the early days they were doing that. I think that they don't do that at all anymore. One day you will log in and you will have magically the education account. So you will be transformed into the education account. There is actually a way for you to check if you go into your account settings and um, look at the billing section, it says what type of account you have in that section. It says Canva Basic or Canva for Education or Canva Pro account. That is where you'll know, yes, I've got access to the education account. So that's the one main thing is to 
not be waiting for an email to confirm your upgrade. Just go keep checking your Canva account. That was a long explanation, sorry. Okay, great. I'll stay on for a little bit longer and, and answer a few more questions. And um, there's lots of thank yous. So thank you for all the thank yous again. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Bonnie, just reading your comment. Uh, um, since you need a school email and use your – oh, Richard, yeah, that's with regard to Canva, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Yes, I should have said that also. It, it seems to me that the people have, who have the quicker success getting their education account are the ones that use a school email. So if you haven't already set up your Canva account, your free one, or if you just did it, <laughs> just set up one with your school email. I think that makes the process easier. And Richard, I reckon, yes, you probably can switch it over. Um, so what I've also learned in the past few months is that if you're having problems or your account um, has not been upgraded to education, even though you applied a while ago, it's been a week or so, you get the best response from them if you head to their, uh, there's a support link and it's a chat window through Messenger, Facebook Messenger. If you send them a message through that or if you're on Twitter and you send the Canva for Education people a DM on Twitter, they are really quick and helpful getting back to people. By all reports, that's what I've heard. So if you're not sure what's going on, check through that, those systems. Yeah, Martin's just confirming. Yep, yeah, I'm. I don't have a ca uh, an education account through Canva. I have a. I've been paying for a pro account since they started their pro account version. Um. So yeah. So I'm. I've got that. Um. Yeah, which <laughs> which has proved to be interesting when doing a course uh, based for, on Canva for education because I've had to send uh, the lovely Debbie O'Shea, who's a teacher in Australia here, I keep messaging her <laughs> saying, can you check whether your Canva for education account has this feature because I'm about to make a whole training video <laughs> on it and I don't want to make a training video if it's only something in my pro account and not in your education account. Uh, there's been one main thing where... I've made a video about something which was not in the education version. But anyway, I think it's only one main thing. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, private teachers, it's a little bit harder. I, I would try and um, plead your case, especially if let's say you're a piano teacher and you've got, I don't know, you've got all these students that you're teaching and you're, you're working for yourself. I Surely. I would hope that they would maybe, you know, uh, go for it. <laughs> Um, Katie, do you have any recommendation for online to a website to create lesson videos other than Loom and iMovie? Um, yeah, the the thing that I use for – so Loom and Screencastify and iMovie are awesome for simple videos. And as soon as you want to do more complex things, more interesting things um, and have multiple things going on or one video fading into another or, I don't know, lots of different things, things uh, – you know where you'll see a part of the screen will zoom in so you can see more clearly and then zoom out again. All of those things you need to get a more fully featured video editing software program. So I personally use ScreenFlow and that is Mac only. So ScreenFlow for Mac. ScreenFlow allows me to record my video screen but also my webcam and I can import videos from my iPhone or my iPad or wherever or things that I find on the internet. If I buy stock footage, I can put it into the screen flow and then I can do all those things. I can add animation, I can add transitions, I can put text on the screen, I can have one video going into another, B-roll, all that sort of fancy stuff. Um, Camtasia would be a rough equivalent for PC users. Um, and then if you want to do not necessarily recording your screen but more traditional video editing, uh, Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro are really good options for those. ScreenFlow does everything I need personally. So I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time on the other sort of more fully featured options because it does everything I want. And thank you for saying I'm awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, can a teacher candidate apply for the Canva education account? I don't know the answer to that, guest 2758. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. 
I can't, I don't know what proof you have to give them that you're a teacher. So it, if you have, um, what do you call it? Like a, what's it called? Like a transcript from your educational institute saying you're a qualified teacher, uh, that might be enough. I don't, I don't know if you're in a position where you have that yet. Um, just maybe ask them. I, I get on that support message system -y thing. Thank you, Doug. Yes, Richard was a cat about Canva. And yes, I think I've talked about that already. Excellent. Um, yeah, Martin's talking about the video thing too, Maria. Yeah, Maria's just confirming. Maria's done great work during the Canva course. I'm just going to say that to everyone. <laughs> and Maria, I nearly showed some of your uh, examples in the session today. I decided just to stick to my own thing. But, um, yeah, I nearly showed a whole range of things from everyone. Um, but, yes, they are really quick through that Facebook Messenger. She's confirming. So try that. Dale, yeah, Dale, so the printing from Canva, if you want to print from Canva and it, Canva and it's asking you to pay money, that is because you've used elements in your design that are pro elements, premium elements, and they are not the free elements. So you, you don't have to pay anything to print from Canva, but you just need to make sure that you've used free elements in your design. Or if you've got an education account, you'll just have access to those premium ones at no cost. So at the point where you go to download or print and it says that'll be a dollar for your whatever design, you can actually see it shows you in the download window. It shows you what is the element that you're being charged for. And it's only an element. It's not the whole design. It's just the element or elements, plural, that you've used in your design. And then you go, oh, there's a a picture of a guitar that I've used and it wants to charge me, you go back to your design, you search in the library and you look for a free one and you replace it in your design and then you download for free. So that's just their, that's how they make money on the free account uh, people is that you can use it totally for free if you want to, but you need to be um, choosy about the elements you use because they will ask you to pay for their premium elements. That is, you know, the way it's designed. So, yeah, you can just uh, use free elements only. You can also upload your own design elements into Canva. So if you have a picture of a guitar on your desktop, you can put that into Canva and use that in your design. Download, still free to download that way. When you hover your mouse over elements that, uh, that you search for, it will say free or pro. Um, so you can check things that way. Yep, great. So hopefully that clears that up. Yeah, Mark, there's a link for the PD certificate. Martin's provided that. Man, I'm, oh no, I'm nearly caught up. This is good. Um, guest 9040, Music Tech Teacher website is a great resource but can't continue after December due to it being flashed. So um, I need to, I will clarify actually. So Karen Garrett, who's the music teacher, she's got a fantastic website where she has a whole stack of um, really useful free games on a page. Now, not all of them are flash-based, not all of them. So what she's – I actually checked her website just the other day because I knew a lot of them were flash-based and I thought, wow, um, it's going to be hard work to update uh, a lot of those things. Now, what she's done on her website, and I'm not sure if you've been there recently, but she's actually updated – I think she's got 50 games which are updated to newer technology, which you can use – and I think they might be in a column which is called mobile or something like that. Then she's got a couple of other columns of, yes, the older games which are flash-based and they will not continue. And she's actually got a note on the page saying that the, the software she used to build those games in the first place, the software does not exist anymore or is no longer being updated. So she cannot fix them because she can't access the software and anyway, they're flash-based, <laughs> so if that makes sense. So don't write it off completely. There are still a number of games on there that will work, um, and then I'm not sure what her plans are, whether she's planning to replace some of those with newer things or, or whatever it is. Uh, Christine's asked, what's a free notation source that works with MIDI? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Oh, yeah, Martin's said... Notation software that works with MIDI, I'm guessing you're asking. Yeah, like Martin said, MuseScore or NoteFlight. NoteFlight personal account version um, 
both fantastic options. And uh, MuseScore is one that you download to your computer, so Mac or PC only. NoteFlight will work on Mac, PC and Chromebooks if you're using Chromebook. Uh, Narissa had a couple of questions. Can I share the resource list and resources guide with other teachers in my district? Um, my my preference is that you send them the, the link to the page where they get the email with the copy themselves. If you can, I would appreciate that greatly. Um, lots of work goes into that guide, so it helps me. It helps me communicate with more teachers because they end up joining my mailing list. And you can leave the mailing list after you've downloaded the guide if you want to. Uh, if you want to share the Wakelet collection, feel free to go ahead and send that link out as is. That's no problem. And yes, you can download videos from Flipgrid. So uh, as a teacher, you go into your back-end dashboardy bit and any students' videos that are in there, you can download and all that. Uh, Michelle says, many of these free apps require Google Chrome. You're a Mac user without Chrome. Have you run into issues? Uh, Michelle, you need to go and get Chrome, download Chrome. Just, I use, this is all I use. I only use Chrome for my browser. I don't use Safari at all. Um, go and install Chrome. You have to have Chrome as a musician. Um, and that's not being dramatic. <laughs> the, the music websites require Chrome. They, um, they either only work on Chrome or they work better on Chrome. And uh, as a, I actually had a slide, I, I took it out, I don't know why, but I, uh, I had a slide early on saying, for all of these websites, download and install Chrome if you are not using it already. So yeah, just it's free. It's free and you just use that as your browser um, and definitely use it. If, you're at a, if you have a Mac which is run by your school, like controlled by your school and they don't allow you to install things yourself, go and ask the IT person to install it for you or to give you permission to do that. Uh, it's impossible to... Yeah, Martin's just said it's free to download. <laughs> uh, great. Kara's just applied for Canva. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can log into the free version, Kara. I suspect you don't have the education account yet, but you'll just go and apply for that um, separately. Josie said, what would you recommend to make DVDs with menus for my own recorded contents for students without internet access? Wow. Um, do the students have access to a DVD player? That would be the first thing I'm asking uh, because I would suspect many don't. If they do, gosh, I don't know the answer to that. It's been so many years since I've made a DVD. Uh, students without internet access. Hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah, Martin says ask school IT person. I would do that. Yeah, I've also used built-in software on my Mac. Like it kind of does that from, it's not iMovie. They had a separate thing, didn't they, Martin, I think. Yeah. I'm going to, I don't have a good answer to that question. I'm <laughs> sorry, Josie. Laurie, yes, it's possible to receive PD certificates for previously viewed webinars. Um, Laurie, if you go to that free, go to my website, midnightmusic.com.au, go to free training, click through to the the one that you watch, the replay link, the PD certificate link is on that page for each one. Um, Vicky from Texas, do I teach classes at TMEA? I have, I've presented at TMEA three times, two or three times in the past few years and was planning to come back in February, but that's not happening. <laughs> so no, uh, I, I do will at some point, maybe in the future. Mm. Yep. Uh, Laurie's district won't allow Flipgrid use due to privacy issues. Is there an alternative? Yeah, I, I don't understand that some districts. Are you in Australia, Laurie? Are you in New South Wales? <laughs> because New South Wales, oh, man. No, you said district. It's more likely you're in the States, I'm guessing. Um, I don't understand why that is the, the thing because my, Microsoft owns Flipgrid. Like, anyway. I don't know. I don't have a good alternative is the bottom line. You, Whatever system you're using, if you're using, um, well, you can't be using Microsoft because they would surely give you access to Flipgrid if you were. 
uh, it, it, for instance, if you're a Google school, you can do it through Google Classroom where or Google, um, yeah, Google Classroom or Google Drive. So one thing, if you, for instance, if you're using Google tools, you can set up a form that students will fill out and then they attach their video and you can make sure that the form allows attachments of certain sizes. So just make sure that you know roughly how big the videos are going to be. And then they can send videos to you that way. You can also have a Google Drive folder set up where they have to upload their video into there. It's a lot more hassle. Um, it's just a lot fiddlier, that's all. Okay, cool. That's good, Cara. Um, so the process, Cara, just to clarify, when you set up your free account to Canva, you've got access to it instantly. Then you apply for the education version and you upload your teaching certificate. It may be a while between you getting access to the extra features inside your Canva account. That's the thing that takes a few days usually. It's not an instantaneous process. It's a... Um, it's checked manually by people at Canva. So they'll check it. They'll, you know, they'll say yes or no or whatever it is. Anyway, good if you've got access. You can still use it in the meantime. IDVD. Thank you. Oh, that was the one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. No, is in New Jersey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> New Jersey. What's New Jersey doing forbidding you from using Flipgrid? I don't know if that was a help, Laurie. Uh, yeah, try try that. Yep, Julie's confirming about little time delay for Canva. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Roxio. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I used that years ago too. Yep. Okay. Cara, thank you. That's good. Okay. I don't know if you say your name that way. <laughs> thank you, Maria. All right. I'm going to wind up now. Um, I'm going to allow my kids to be online now. <laughs> they, they get forbidden from using lots of, um, you know, gaming and Netflix and stuff while I'm doing these webinars. So I will, um, I haven't really, I'm so sorry, people on YouTube as well. Uh, I think there's only a few of you commenting there. So um, it look, looks like Martin was looking after you there. So thank you for joining in on YouTube directly too. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you next month if you decide to join in again with next month's webinar. I have not decided the topic for next month. So I'll leave the chat window in. Yeah, Martin says it's not YouTube. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'll leave the chat window open for a moment. Well, a few, few minutes at least, maybe half an hour. If you have a specific topic that you would like me to cover in a future webinar, I will not make any promises because I may just decide that there's a specific thing I'm going to cover next month. Um, it's usually based on common questions that I see popping up in Facebook groups and so on. I think, okay, that's the thing for next month. If you want to make suggestions, I'm happy to take them. I will probably actually set up a form uh, at some point, not right now, but at some point for people to make suggestions for the future uh, just to talk about stuff. But thank you, Sarah. She says, outstanding and super helpful. Thank you. That's lovely. And other Sarah. Oh, Sarah Crotchet. What a great music name. Do you actually pronounce it Crotchet though? <laughs> or is it Crochet? I <laughs> oh, love it. Uh, when is the next webinar? That is a great question. Let me check for you. It's always the middle of the month and it's always a Wednesday morning for me, Tuesday night for those of you in the States. And the next month one, I usually do have the dates at least organised. Uh, we're looking at the 12th of August. And to be honest, really, there's nothing else going on in my calendar at the moment because we're not allowed to do anything. So I will be here on the 12th of August doing another webinar. Uh, so that's 12th of August for me. It'll be 11th of August for those of you in the States, Tuesday evening, 12th during the day for me. Michelle's going to download Chrome. Yes, do it, do it. <laughs> um, yeah, Michelle, it, it's funny to – I just live in Chrome. I only use Chrome. Uh, Safari to me – it's funny, I, I love Apple stuff, but Safari is one of the things I don't love that much. Uh, it's okay. But Chrome, you really need Chrome as a music uh, person. Um, and the main thing is the reason for that is that all of the places that are developing music-based interactive type websites and software tools, Chrome has the best technology for those. So that is what they recommend you use anyway. So they will say on the website, best in the Chrome browser. And some things just will not work at all if you're not using Chrome. So definitely go do it. 
Sarah says no. <laughs> Is that no to the pronunciation? Uh, yeah, yeah, Cara, it will be interesting to see what needs we have in a month. This will be for real. Yeah, I, I agree. That's why I haven't really decided for next month what, what the thing is going to be. Um, one option that I thought about was, uh, I don't know, it's a bit vague, but something to do with hybrid teaching or, um, you know, things that you can do where you've got kids in all the different situations, I, you know, like some are online, some are in person, some have no internet access. I, I don't know really. Uh, I haven't thought it through specifically, so... Uh, Lenore, I'd love to know best video editing tools for virtual choir. Awesome question. <laughs> we love this question. Um, okay, Lenore, I'm going to give you the short. Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at that link from Martin that he put there. Lenore, I'm going to just tell you, and I'm going to be really straight about this. So when I wrote the article that Martin's linked to, which is please stop asking how to create a virtual choir video, I didn't mean that as in don't ever do this project because it's a great project to pursue. When I wrote it, everyone had just gone to online teaching and I, my personal opinion was it was so far down the priority list of what I thought everyone should be looking at. People were struggling with how to run their live uh, Zoom session or Google Meet session or how, to, how the lessons were going to look, you know, in an online situation. And that project is so, so involved, so involved. I can't tell you how involved that project is and how time-consuming and technically difficult it is. Now, this is not to say do not attempt it because it can be a great thing to do. But I will tell you that everybody that I've seen who has gone, no, I am going to do this, I really want to do this for my kids, Every single person that I've seen who's posted about their end result has said <laughs> one of two things. A, that took so many hours it was ridiculous and people have been putting online, that's taken 50 hours, 70 hours of my time, 50, 40 hours of my time. I have not seen anything less than about 40 hours worth of work gone into it unless you're working with a very small group of kids. So anything with a, a reasonable size choir, lots and lots of hours the second thing is is that everybody almost everyone I've seen comment that has taken it on themselves and if they've had no experience with this in the past has said never again I'm just going to tell you that now because I just I don't want you to go through the heartache of <laughs> realizing that it's such a hard thing so one thing I can suggest is there are lots of people who have popped up saying, I'm good at this, I know how to do this and I have the software, so let me do it for you. There are a few people who are offering that service and I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but if you just do a bit of Googling or asking in Facebook groups, there are people who will do it for you. You send, They'll tell you the best way to go about it. There's a whole workflow involved gathering videos from kids, all of these things. There's a lot of things you need to set up ahead of time and tell the kids. Anyway, then after that, if you have not used the software yourself before, if you do not have video editing skills and you don't already have audio editing skills, it's just going to be a much longer, harder process. If you are already a skilled video editor and audio editor, then take it on. Absolutely, I think take it on. And if you still want to do it, which again, I'm not saying don't do it. If you still do want to pursue it, just be prepared for the fact that there is a massive steep learning curve and it's going to take up a lot of time. And it's worthwhile time if you want to spend your time that way. I hope that makes sense. And I don't want to kind of put people off. That was not ever my intent with that article. <laughs> Martin said the same thing, don't be put off by the title. So in that article, I, I run through what the overall basic process is I talk about software in that article, um, things that people are using. There's not one right answer. There's no easy option. There's no magic software that will do it for you. And I even put that in the article. Um, and even actually, there's a lot of comments underneath the article. Uh, a few people have popped in there saying, I'm offering this service. So um, pursue that if you, if you really want to. Take it on and learn the software if you want to do that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I said it was going to be a short answer, but it's not. 
Lenore said eight hours of work for a three-minute combined video. Eight hours, I, I'm going to say eight hours is very fast. If, if I took this on, I know how to use the video editing software and the audio editing software. If I spent only eight hours, yeah. Yeah, so Martin's agreeing if you're tech savvy, yeah. If I spent only eight hours on one of those projects, I'd be impressed with myself. Like I would be happy with eight hours. Um, and, yeah, it's about priorities. Like if you've got the time and the motivation and you really want to learn these things, they are awesome skills to learn. But it's about time and priorities. So if you don't have 10 hours, 20 hours, 40 hours, whatever it is it's going to take, if you don't have that time at your disposal that you're happy to spend on this project, then um, maybe don't do it. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Lino, look, if you do it and you go never again, then, hey, it's all a learning. There's never anything you can do which is a bad experience in my book. Um, it's just about it's an experience. And if it's one that you go, oh, my gosh, never again, that's okay. Now you know. Or you might get to the end of it and go, man, I had no idea how much I would love doing video editing. That's also a great valid um, thing to get out of a project like this. Um, Thanks, Martin. Thank you and goodbye. And the other thing is I just also think te music teachers particularly, like we see so many of these virtual choir videos floating around and they're all heartwarming and they bring a tear to your eye. It, all of them make me tear up, all of them, without fail. But it's for three minutes and <laughs> the parents are going to go, oh, that's awesome, and the kids are going to go, oh, wow, I love that. That's such a great memory that we now have of our performance, Our one of our songs that we've done this year. That's awesome. And for three minutes it's great and then in about two weeks' time when they stop sharing it and stop talking about it, you've still spent, you know, 50 hours putting it together and for three minutes it, it's kind of come and gone. So, you know, you just got to weigh it up. But as I said, I'm not saying don't do it. It's not a flat no, don't do it. Just be uh, open to what's involved. Great. Uh, Lisa says, I'm not sure where to access the website. Do you have a link? Um, Lisa, I'm not sure what that was in regards to, but uh, I will just give you that Wakelet link if I can actually find it now. <laughs> Uh, the Wakelet link has all of the links of the things that I talked about. I've just posted it in the YouTube comments section, Lisa. We, we can chat later about that if we need to anyway. All right. Um, oh, Brielle's just asking... Um, about uh, question about can you Brielle can you just tell me what that question was about hours on the certificate did it have the hour have you downloaded it and it didn't have the hours you were expecting on there I'll wait for you to type something in Brielle if you're still on uh, usually we just nominate an, an amount. We actually set the, the funny thing with the PD certificate is we set it up ahead of time, not knowing how long I'm actually going to take on the webinar <laughs> and we just make a stab in the dark. So if it's related to, hang on, I've been on for two hours and there's only one hour on the PD certificate, that's why. Uh, I think Michelle usually puts 90 minutes or two hours. Something. Oh, it doesn't mention the hours. Okay. I will, I will check. All right. Okay, cool. Okay. I will get on to Michelle and see if she can fix that up. Grace asks, how do you design in the Word Art? Grace, there are some YouTube videos and walkthrough tutorials about how to do that. You type in words um, and hit visualise. That's the basic version and then it will show your thing on the right. But there's all sorts of settings you can change. It's um, it's beyond this webinar for me to explain that to you. But there's definitely, uh, I think on the menu bar, there's a link to help or tutorials. So check that out. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Brielle. Thank you, Laura, for letting me know. Um, we'll get that fixed. You'll have to fill out the form again, I think, probably. Yep. To get the corrected version. All right. I better sign off and get that fixed before uh, 500 people go and download the, the PD certificate because then Michelle's going to get a whole heap of emails about it afterwards. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll sign off now and... Um, and yeah, that'll be uh, it'll be great to see you next month if you get on to the next month's webinar. And I'll look forward to catching up with you all then. Okay.